about three decades ago, and then, as they say, it fell into bad company, and <laughs> we, we weren't any more. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure with Rubina's leadership, uh, we will get back, and I'm very much looking forward to that and to working with her. Anyway, the, the, the purpose of this morning, I, I'm not the star attraction, I'm just a, a warm-up act, basically. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the purpose of this morning, essentially, is to congratulate, first of all, and welcome our London team uh, for the elections next year. And um, particularly, congratulations to Siobhan Benitez. Um, <laughs> Followed the last mayoral election, will remember she was a fantastically impressive independent candidate who impressed everybody, I think, across the political spectrum. There was a tremendous talent here that wasn't harnessed, and anyway, she's agreed to take on our harness, and I'm sure we'll be stronger for that. Uh, and if we um, do well, as I'm sure we will, uh, we potentially have a, a substantial team of um, assembly candidates behind her. Uh, Caroline Pidgeon has served the party brilliantly as our sole representative, but uh, if as we will do substantially better, we will see Ima Malik, Lucy Salek, Chris, Joyce Anstead, and others on the assembly, and that's what we're looking for uh, over the next year. Now, there is a, a kind of standard narrative about London that we have to dispel. I mean, the standard narrative is that this is a Labour city and the Conservatives will challenge them because they have this base in the suburbs and everybody else, including us, will put up a gallant little fight that we, we won't achieve anything at a mayoral level. I think that narrative is open to be broken, um, particularly in the context of a, a kind of new and more fluid politics that I think we will see in the aftermath of Brexit. But even on the basis of the experience we currently have, I think there are plenty of good reasons for being much more optimistic than the traditional assumption about the mayoral elections. At the, in the May elections this year, we did exceptionally well. Um, as you all know, we, we won my borough, Richmond, and Kingston by very large majorities. We made a serious inroads into Merton and Harringay. We were the only party that actually won boroughs. Uh, we held our own in Southwark, having been told we would be wiped out. Uh, and there were other bright spots around, which mean that we now have a very substantial base in local government. The, uh, the one big electoral test, which was the Lewisham East by election, we got an extraordinary 20% swing. I think there are pe many people in this audience who were there, worked their socks off, and demonstrated how, in an unpromising scene with initially a small vote, we actually came very close. And in the uh, by elections, in local elections we've had since, we've been lifting our vote by roughly 10%. On average. So there are a lot of good things been happening in London at the election level, combined with the fact that we now have a larger membership than the Conservatives in London, and there's certainly a much more <coughs> active and younger one. Um, the fact that the Conservatives have a candidate, I've never met him, but by all accounts is not very convincing. Um, and then you have a, an incumbent mayor. I had nothing against um, Mayor Khan, a perfectly affable individual, but it's very difficult to finger what is actually done. Um, I mean, I had a meeting two days ago with the First Minister of Scotland, uh, another big devolved uh, power, um, and whatever you think about Scottish nationalists, their leader is a charismatic figure and it's possible to identify a whole lot of things that the Scottish government has actually done. It's, I, I find it difficult to think of anything that's happened in London since May Khan took over. Um, we've had the deterioration in the law and all position, um, particularly life crime. Of course, in part, that's due to a lack of funding from central government, but there is a, clearly a lack of leadership in London itself. In almost every other respect, the, you know, the capital is st standing still in terms of political leadership. So I think when you put all of that together, uh, there is a real opportunity to break through, and I know that's why Siobhan has taken this on, and is optimistic that we will. 
So I, I think the context in which all this will happen uh, is going to be very heavily moulded by what happens in Brexit. And this morning we're in a, a calm before the storm. Um, we don't know what will happen within the next few weeks, but it will probably determine the country's future for the next quarter and a half century. It's massively important. And really all normal politics is on hold because of this. I, mean, I was due to be going to Leeds on Thursday to talk to our activists there and was pulled back from King's Cross Station because of another Prime Minister's statement. Everything we do, everything the civil servants do is currently on hold until the, the Brexit issue is in some way resolved. Uh, I, I think there are some things we can say. Uh, the first is that despite all the uh, propaganda from the government side, nobody can yet make a case that, that Brexit provides us with a better outcome than remaining in the European Union. Um, most of the scenarios are massively worse. There was a fascinating exchange, I don't know whether any of you heard it, with the Prime Minister being questioned yesterday, and then again Hammond this morning. Um, and the question that was asked is, can you honestly say that we'd be better off outside the European Union than in it? And I heard Hammond on this this morning, and there was, a, there was almost a 10 second pause. <laughs> And then he blustered something about, well, that's what the people have decided. <laughs> that was the end of the question. So we, we have this situation where we have a relationship with the European Union. It, of course, it must be reformed. It's not ideal. A lot of things need to be changed. But it is clearly unambiguously better than what is now being offered. We now have a clearer picture of what is being offered. And it's a combination of this draft treaty, the withdrawal agreement that was presented to Parliament uh, 10 days ago, and the declaration that was presented two days ago. It, it, it's, uh, the declaration isn't a treaty, it's, a, as one Tory MP put in a rather barbed way, it's a wish list. Uh, and uh, I raised a question with the Prime Minister uh, when she presented it about something that didn't, wasn't actually central, but I think summed up the tone of it, that we currently have very close collaborative arrangements with the European Union on things like medicines, on the chemists, ch chemicals, and aircraft safety. I mean, we're very tightly tied into those rules. They provide all kinds of assurance on public safety. And the passage in this new draft declaration referred to it is that we will commit ourselves to examining the possibility of cooperation <laughs> in these areas. And everything to do with the future, what kind of trade relationship, is based on this extraordinarily vague, inconclusive uh, language. Uh, and the one thing that I think you have to take from that is that this argument, which is gaining currency, which is, you know, get on with it, look, we're fed up with this, you know, just, just agree to something, let's get on with our lives. That is a complete canard, because if the government's plan goes ahead, we will be arguing about Brexit week in, week out, year in, year out, for the next few years. Nothing is yet determined other than the divorce agreement, which commits us to paying the 39 billion, makes worryingly vague assurances about the rights of citizens uh, and introduces the transition under which we remain part of the European Union rules without having any say over them. It is a very unsatisfactory situation in almost every respect uh, and there is now a widespread rebellion um, on the Tory ranks, both Remainers, who think this is a dreadful outcome, and even the Brexiteers who confidently say, well, actually, we'd probably be better off within the European Union, which is what even Farage and uh, Boris Johnson have been saying. It is, it is a mess. And the problem which we have in London is that there will be a disproportionate mess for a variety of reasons, because this city depends above all on a vibrant service sector, Canary Wharf embodies all of that in relation to financial services, but it isn't just financial services, the creative industries, 
the digital companies, all of these at present depend on having close relationships with the European Union within the single market. There is absolutely no guarantee that those relationships will be maintained, they will be diluted, we will be uh, a, a rather distant partner of the European Union on services, and the potential impact on London is, is devastating. I mean, not only will there be a shock impact, but we're potentially looking at years of decline if, if indeed the European Union with the Brexit withdrawal goes ahead on its present basis. Plus, London's a resilient city, but the prospects of Brexit are, are really not good. And it isn't just a question of the future of the services industry. Um, London depends more than any other city in the UK on migrant workers for the hospitals as well as for the private sector. Uh, but industries like construction, which have been relatively booming, as we see from all the cranes, I mean, they depend heavily on migrant workers, many of them from Eastern Europe. Uh, none of the construction companies can see a way forward because if we introduce a visa regime with a, a salary threshold, which is um, Theresa May's preferred option, about £30,000, it will be very, very difficult to recruit. Um, you know, the building industry and what depends on it could well come to a shuttering halt. Massive implications, for example, for housing costs. A few houses will be built. Those that will be built will be more expensive. So those are some of the things that we're looking at. Now the question is, what, what am I and my colleagues doing in Parliament to stop it? Well, we are working on cross-party groupings. I now have a team of 12 MPs. I think we're punching well above our weight. Uh, but there are several problems that we've got to crack uh, in the next few weeks. I mean, one of them is building a coalition around the people's vote. Now, we've got a, a wind gathering in our sails behind us. There's clear public support for a people's vote. Uh, business uh, sentiment has expressed this morning through a business <coughs> show that the majority of them think that this is the way forward. The situation is quite unlike what we had when the referendum took place. It is politically uh, highly defensible that you back to the public and say you want what the government's negotiated or you want to stay in the European Union. Perfectly defensible position. But we have to build a coalition uh, that will see this through. Uh, we're currently working with a uh, Conservative MP, Sarah Wollaston, Maverick. Very liberal uh, Tory MP, and we'll be working with a team of Labour people. Some of our potential allies, like the SNP, are not completely reliable, but there is, a, there is an alliance building up which will be very much at the centre to make this happen. But that's only one part of the process that we're going to be going through the next few weeks. I mean, one of the central problems is to get the idea of no deal off the table. Because one of the compelling arguments that the government has with its own supporters, with the public, and with business is to say, well, okay, you don't like what we've done. I'm sorry, but we've done our best. But if you don't vote for it, we'll be crashing out in the no deal, and there will be chaos. And that argument is superficially attractive and it is currently uh, the default position uh, within the um, Article 50 process. But it, it, I think everybody involved with this problem realizes that it would be suicidal and stupid. It would inflict vast damage on the country. There is absolutely no justification for it. So one of the things that I'm doing with um, people in other parties is to try to build a coalition around the idea that we take no deal off the table. That ceases to be an option. So that the only two options that are then available is the government's proposal and remaining within the European Union. And I think when we narrow it down to that choice, uh, we have a, a much better, well, a better chance of winning and be a much more rational level uh, on emotional uh, discussion. And then the final step is when the proposals come forward to actually defeat the government and make sure that the government deal doesn't pass. And 
I think of the various camps we've now got, that probably is the easiest one. There is no majority. The government's working hard. The Tory MPs have been offered uh, jobs in the government. Some of them are taking it. Mr. Hammond from Wimbledon is a good example. Uh, some of them being offered foreign trips, some of them being offered uh, knighthoods. I don't know whether Sir George and I will have to bury ours if, when it's suitably devalued. Uh, but they've been <laughs> hand, handed out like confetti at the moment. Um, you know, the library is quite a powerful force, and the government is desperate, and that's what they're resorting to. But I think it's not going to work. We are going to find in a couple of weeks' time that there is no majority for what the government's proposal, and we have then to press ahead with our option, which is, as I say, gathering support in the public and amongst other parties. So I'm confident that by the time we sit here around the Christmas tree, we will have resolved this in our favor. It's, 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 it's a transit time, it's risky, it's dangerous, and an enormous amount at stake. But perhaps just in, in conclusion, just make the point that by the time Siobhan and her team are competing, all of this issue will at least have moved on. I, you know, hopefully we'll have killed it, but if we haven't killed it, there will be continuing if a much lower level of obsession with Brexit, and we'll be able to set out, hopefully, our vision of a better future for this country. Um, and certainly a team of people campaigning for the Liberal Democrats in London have got to focus, I would say, I mean, you set your own agenda, but I would say the housing issue is absolutely preeminent. I have a weekly advice surgery in Twickenham, which is by no means the most deprived borough in London. And I get every week, you know, the most awful uh, position of you know, low-earning families, completely unable to contemplate under occupation, way, way, way beyond anything that they could contemplate, uh, but also because the ownership market has spilled over into rentals, uh, unable to afford rent, living in substandard accommodation, being forced out by their landlords who want to raise the rent, I and mean, an enormous amount of hardship of middle and low income families being driven out of London. So focusing on that problem, Getting houses built, but not just houses, but making sure they're affordable, seems to me an absolutely central preoccupation. I think another issue where the Democrats, I think, will uniquely make the agenda is in relation to environmental issues. This has all been put on the back burner. We know there is tremendous potential threat to the planet as well as our own country. Uh, we know that if we lose the protection of the European Union, many of the environmental standards we have will be um, will deteriorate. So we've got to give environment an absolutely central place in our argument. We know that there are issues around clean air. There is a the massive issue of Heathrow, which is unresolved, and we argue vehemently for environmental rather than narrowly commercial objectives. And perhaps as a, as a third area, and the one which I personally am heavily involved in, is having a very clear um, economic message, which is different from what the Conservatives and the Labour Party can offer. And this is partly a question of being uh, sensitive, alive to the needs of the business community, being a you know, pro-market, liberal party, which is uh, something the Labour Party could ever possibly claim under its current leadership, but at the same time being alert to the issue of unfairness and inequality, which is absolutely extreme in London. I mean, we don't fund this to anything like the same extent in the north of England or Scotland. These vast disparities between uh, a very poor underclass and extraordinary wealth, much of it reflected in property. And we have to confront that and offer a fair uh, alternative. So there's a series of issues on which we have to campaign and build up. Uh, we're not just about Brexit, but in the meantime, we have to win the Brexit battle. So I'm optimistic we can do that, optimistic that we will make serious waves in London next year. And thanks to all of you for the work you've been putting in. Thanks to our hosts. Thank you very much.
Well, um, Vince has agreed to take a few really, questions. Really, um, we haven't got about uh, welcoming this table. and as you can see, um, uh, Chris our MP Tom Bricks. Thank you. So if that's show, mm -hmm. bring your head up. Just like to say who you are before you ask your question. Hi, I'm Stephen Beenick from Wandsworth. Um, I'm curious what's the uh, part of the information that the local must do is when our, if our local MP is, say, pro people's vote. Uh, do you have any advice on how we should approach our messaging? Well, I, I, I you mean that, that there are Labour and Conservative MPs who basically agree with us on the Brexit issue. Um, you're saying we should give them an easy time. Is that the. What the advice on that? No, no, I mean, I, I, of course, in every other respect, we're defending the position of the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, and we're vehemently opposed to their major platforms. So you don't stop campaigning, and uh, as it happened, when I returned to Parliament last year, uh, that my opponent, my Conservative opponent, was an extremely likable uh, woman doctor who was vehemently anti-Brexit and it didn't stop us having a fierce and effective campaign. So we've got to keep on with that obviously. But in the short run, we're trying to build alliances. I don't think the two things are incompatible. Thank you. Elena Tanbiza, Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, Vince, you were saying you're building a cross-party coalition against Theresa May's Brexit deal. How will you ensure that every Liberal Democrat MP will vote against the deal? Well, uh, I think it's fair to say that the overwhelming majority of Liberals <laughs> are absolutely committed and totally solid. We, we have one who perhaps should be nameless who believes that his particular constituency, <coughs> like Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, is a separate kingdom and should be uh, judged separately. We, we are working on him and his local party are working on him. But it, it, it's a rather bizarre situation. He He's a strong Remainer. His constituency is now in favour of Remain. But he made a public pledge at a meeting attended, I think, by 20 people where he said he would respect the, uh, the verdict of, in the referendum of his, of his constituency. And he attaches great importance to personal honour, which I admire, uh, but it's completely misplaced in the current context. So no, we, we are working on it, but we have... Um, I, 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 the simple truth is we have, the overwhelming majority of our, of our team are absolutely 100% on board, but we have one problem. Last of all, from Sutton. Um, this just relating to that previous question, uh, leaving aside MPs, um, I see Liberal Democrat as pragmatic liberals in the middle, uh, meaning that they look at the case and, and decide, because we've, we've been on the left or the right, uh, middle and the right of middle throughout. And as such, as a member, uh, for years we've been trying to say that we need to reform EU, uh, and our position, whether in coalition or MP MPs, we're unable to actually do anything. And, and now that Theresa May has come with something in the middle, <coughs> pragmatically, accepting some things, uh, rejecting some things, uh, uh, do you not see, pragmatically, there are some uh, 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 good uh, value if you want to reform uh, EU? Is that an opportunity for reform? Well, it is. Uh, I don't think we should just assume that um, being Liberal Democrats, we're in the middle of every issue. We're not. I think, unfortunately, we got that reputation in the coalition years, and it hasn't helped us. I mean, there are some issues on which we are much more radical than the other parties, and the environment is one of them. But just to give an example, two weeks ago, we had a vote on the budget, uh, and John McDonald, so trying to... Um, in some other incredible way, trying to establish himself as a new Tony Blair, um, persuaded the Labour Party that they should vote in favour of lifting the tax thresholds on high earners. We took the view that that was completely perverse in the current position, and that there was a much greater priority for uh, channelling the money to uh, universal credit, or to some of the public spending areas, which are under an enormous amount of pressure. 
And so we, we voted against the lifting the threshold on high earners. The Labour Party didn't. So in a sense, we, we're, we're overtaking Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party on the left, at least on that issue. Uh, so, that, you know, there are clearly, there are issues in which we want to be not just different, but more radical than either the Conservative or Labour Party. So I think using the word pragmatic is slightly dangerous, I think, in this context. That's not, we're not just a party of splitting the difference. We mustn't be in that position. So we've only got time for a couple more. Just from here. Uh, uh, I'm Abul Asad from Taham. Uh, it's regarding Brexit again. Uh, the Liberal, rightly, they've been leading the issue. But when the crunch time comes, the media, they are not giving a priority to the Liberal ideology about the Brexit. Brexit. It's a national important issue. Now, even uh, the former Labour, Tories, they have been interviewed on many occasions on all the national medias. I mean, uh, in the crunch time, these days, media make people hero or media make people zero. Uh, can you comment on this, please? Because I feel uh, the Liberals should have uh, uh, massive publicity as it's, it's, it's not getting it as it, it should be. Oh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the, the problem is, you know, every day um, we are trying to get either myself or Tom Brake over there, who's our spokesman on this, in, into the front of the media. It's, we push every day to do it. But the answer that always comes back from uh, the BBC or the Whatever, is well, you've only got 12 MPs, so why should we give you preeminence over the official opposition? So that, that, that's the position we're kind of trapped in. Uh, the, the other is that our position is known. Um, everybody knows we're against Brexit, they know we're for the people's vote. The people they want to talk to uh, are the people who are wobbling in the middle, and that's the nature of news. So, yeah, we. we the, the, the big tactical problem we have in the next few weeks is whether we want to try to get the right result, i.e. stopping Brexit, which means working with other people, or the way, whether we go around waving our own banner, uh, which is uh, attractive, may get more attention, and not get the same result. So th there, is, there is a tricky dilemma, but if anybody in the audience has any brilliant ideas for uh, Taking the BBC or some other <laughs> suitable vehicle, I, I, I'd be interested to know what it is. Linda um, Wade, Kensington, Chelsea. Um, taking on the point about uh, the position of Labour, uh, both nationally and globally, vis-à-vis uh, -vis, um, Brexit. Uh, interestingly enough, we tried to get a people's vote. Uh, from Kensington and Chelsea. Unfortunately, the Labour the, uh, leader of the party has actually did a, a deal with the Conservative whip not to have one. So it's quite interesting as to how to read the mixed messages that we're getting from MPs and from local Labour Party uh, members. Have you any ideas as to how well, to I don't, I don't think it's difficult to read the Labour Party leadership. It's fairly clear what they one, um, the Corbyn McDonnell group who control the Parliamentary Labour Party and the, the party as a whole are very pro Brexit. That's what they want. They've been working for it from the beginning. And after the referendum, it wasn't Theresa May, it was uh, Jeremy Corbyn who put down the motion demanding an immediate Article 50 so that we could leave. And his reasoning is twofold. I mean, one is his traditional 1970s philosophy that uh, the European Union is part of a capitalist conspiracy and we've got to destroy it. Uh, and the other is more tactical. They take the view that if Brexit happens, uh, it will be damaging to the economy and the country and that will create better conditions for a socialist breakthrough politically. So, uh, however, the vast majority of Labour MPs, of their members, of momentum, as it happens, 
uh, and of the Unite Union, which is the main paymaster, are all very, very clear that they want to stop Brexit. Uh, and McCluskey, who is the key power in the Labour Party after the leadership, um, is heads a union that is made up of airport workers uh, and car workers and manufacturing employees who have everything to lose by Brexit. And we understand that by the, by behind the scenes, uh, the leadership is being told under, under no uncertain times, stop playing games and stop sitting on the fence. Their official position is that they want an opportunity to have a general election, and if that fails, they will get behind the people's vote. Well, the question I'm asking them, in Parliament and outside, is, well, if you really want a general election, why don't you get up your backsides and move on at the moment? I mean, the country at the moment doesn't have a government. Government business isn't being passed. The Democratic Unionists have walked away. If there were ever a time to have a vote of no confidence in an election, this would be it. But Corbyn doesn't move. And we can infer from that, I think, that he's not actually sincere, that this is just an excuse. But we'll see. Uh, and we're doing what we can in the meantime to make sure that we work got us off to a great start. <laughs> well, there's going to be plenty of opportunities to continue your questions about Brexit with Tom Brake in the next session that's in this room. We're breaking for uh, tea, which is outside. Um, the fringe room, which is behind us, we have Professor Paul Webb uh, doing a presentation, and there are three training rooms, the other side of the lift, um, which are detailed in your programme. Thank you so, so much. Please you'll be able to have a very day uh, with us. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank Vince and Sir George and uh, Regina for their contributions. Well. And you've been watching our party leader here, um, Sir Vince Cable. Thank you so much for your message, as always, reporting live here today, Juliet Macapilla. And um, thanks to everyone watching. I've seen you, Sue Kedrick, and every single person love you to be and thank you for joining in from outside and um, of course joining in into the lived-in conference here in london many many thanks and follow me today at jnm1000 and of course at london lived-ins we've got our london lived-in and London Autumn Regional Conference 2018 happening here today. Thank you so much, Wanda. Thank you so much. We'll speak soon. Um